Okay, we are going to return to a discussion of Eric Fromm. And Eric Fromm was a, a psychoanalyst who uh, actually is the second person that we're studying who never met Freud. Uh, and most of the psychoanalysts up until now, as you notice with the exception of Harry Stack Sullivan, actually had a period of time where they studied under Freud. And it was after studying under Freud that they decided that what he was saying really wasn't accurate and so they developed their own theories. Now we're getting into people who became part of psychoanalytic schools, maybe did not have a direct experience with Freud, uh, and therefore their breaks were, were more intellectual and didn't involve like having to, to tell a friend, uh, or in the case of Freud, for many of them a mentor, uh, that he was wrong. Now, Fromm is really quite an interesting man. He, he was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1900. And he was the, the only child of Jewish parents. Uh, and, and he was very Jewish. He was a dedicated student of the Torah. And, and he really developed a love for his ethnic background. And a sad result of this was that he responded very strongly to anti-Semitism. And, and he experienced a lot of isolation uh, when he was a youngster because Jewish youngsters were undergoing very difficult times uh, when he was growing up. Now, on top of that, of, that, of being very, a very committed Jew and, and seeing all the anti-Jewish sentiment that was around him, uh, he also came from a family that had a lot of conflict. Uh, his father was described as over-anxious, and his mother was described as depression-prone. And then there, there is a, an event described in Fromm's life, when you, you read his history, that was especially painful. Uh, there was a, a woman friend of the family uh, who was beautiful and successful and talented. And when Fromm was 12, this woman committed suicide. And this was you know, one of those kind of dramatic moments for him to, to learn that it would be possible that somebody would take their life. And, and remember now, this is a young man who was really loving his life, even in the midst of the conflict that he saw. And what this suicide uh, did to Fromm is it motivated him to really begin to examine what is the meaning that people have in life. That is, as he reflected back later in his life, he realized that what happened at, when he saw that somebody would take their life, which would seem to suggest you know, that they had no meaning, that he began to search for why is it that he has meaning, why do other people have meaning, and you'll see this takes us into a very strong existential influence that existed in his theory. Now, Fromm became a student at the University of Heidelberg. And this was at a time when, when the social sciences were actually delivering a, a number of new ideas. Uh, this was the period, for example, where Karl Marx's theories were very popular. And also, in, in, in biology at that time, Darwin was getting a lot of play. And people were talking about evolution. And, and this was drawing a lot of academic attention. And this was a time when Freud was first starting to get known in the universities, and people were actually talking about this new theory of personality development. And, and Fromm was exposed as a college student to all of, of these theories. And they were particularly important to him because they provided him with, with a meaning of the complex emotional life that he himself was experiencing at the time, but he really couldn't understand it or appreciate it. But he, he liked, certainly, what Freud was saying, because Freud was saying there's a lot that's unknown to you in your emotional life. And here is Fromm, who is having all of these feelings and figuring, you know, I really don't know all that's going on inside myself. And 
Now, what happened uh, with Fromm is that he pursued a PhD in sociology. And, but his real interest from his undergraduate day, uh, days really was in psychoanalysis. And, and certainly psychoanalysis pervaded uh, his academic life uh, from the, the point at which he first got exposed to it. Now, from actually what was analyzed uh, by a psychoanalyst, Hans Sachs, and, and Hans Sachs was uh, a famous analyst of that time. And then Fromm went on for psychoanal psychoanalytic training at the Psychoanalytic Institute in Berlin. And at this latter institution, he encountered such figures as Carl Abraham, whom you may remember was a very significant figure in the life of Karen Horney. And there was Theodore Reich and Franz Alexander these are all the, the leading psychoanalysts of the day, and they're all at this Berlin Psychoanalytic Institute. Now eventually, Fromm immigrated to the United States, and he became an American citizen. Then in 1941, he published his first book, and, and it was on a theory that he was developing, and the book is called Escape from freedom. And essentially what Fromm did is he integrated Marx and Freud as well as other social thinkers, but he developed his own kind of unique uh, socio-psychological theory. And it, it is so, so, excuse me, socio-psychological theory that Fromm really becomes known for. He next published a book called The Sane Society, in which he, he took a philosophical position that Western society is sick because its citizens are alienated both from themselves and from others. And once he began thinking along these lines, this was really the beginning of an existentialist approach to life that appealed uh, to, to Fromm and, and kind of existentialism becomes a real part of all of the rest of his writings. I would mention to you, by the way, Fromm is actually a very interesting person to read. If you were to, to get uh, any of his books, you would probably find this uh, rather intriguing uh, because he was a commentator on the social scene and he was, he was very much into looking at the complexities both of the person and, and the society in which the person operates and how those two really end up forming personality. Now, in the second book, he especially focused on the lack of reflectiveness in the society in which he found himself. And as he looked at Americans, he actually saw people as being managed. He didn't think people were really being creative. He thought their life was being determined. And, and he observed, you know, in factories and other places that, that workers were primarily passive. And they were accepting jobs that really were very dull uh, and possibly inappropriate. Uh, and he saw people as having fantasies about how things could be better, but he didn't see the action at that time of people trying to make life better. So he felt there was a great deal of failure in society. And and his observation was that people were simply too frightened to change things. So what happened was people led these dull lives, experienced these unexciting jobs, uh, but he recognized that he had fantasies. And of course, this was an era, by the way, you know, like when, when movies uh, were, uh, many movies, you know, were real displays, hundreds of actors and actresses and lots of dancing and gowns and things like that. And he saw people escaping to, uh, to kind of a, a grand world that they might like to be in, but actually their, their, their lives were humdrum. Now Fromm's solution for how people could lead uh, an integrated, self-directed life was in his philosophy of humanistic, communitarian socialism. Uh, and these are terms that you'll, you'll see come up several times. His theory involved a social, Can you say it again? Human sure, humanistic, 
communitarian socialism. Okay. Now his theory involved social, legal, political, economic, and a moral system in which individuals took a much more active role in life, in which people really tried to structure their own life in terms of all these interacting systems. Now Fromm posited that if individuals did not take this type of control, they could never really experience themselves as productive and as involved in mature love. So, you know, he was an observer saying, people have to get more active in society and make society the kind of society they want, or they really won't be able to realize their own potential. Now, as with, with other existentialist thinkers of the day, and also, I might add, you know, many psychoanalysts at this period were also uh, very existential in their thinking. Fromm believed that the central motivating behavior for a person is an attempt to find a reason for your existence. That's, that's what people were seeking in life. By the way, as you can tell then, if that's the major thing, then for Fromm, your focus is very future-oriented. That is, your focus is in the here and now, looking out to the future, because you're seeking meaning. Again, very different from the early analysts who would have you spending most of your time looking backwards for meaning. Now, in, in spite of some of the things I've laid out, actually, Fromm was an optimistic theorist. And he believed that people really can choose to lead healthy and productive lives by developing their potentialities. But he also noted that people can choose to escape from responsibility and allow others to control their lives. And in fact, he even went so far as to say he, he thought you could allow people to destroy your life. And, and that's where you know, you've let somebody else have so much control, there really is no you anymore. And again, you know, consistent with existentialist thinkers, Fromm grappled with what happens to a person who truly accepts responsibility for his or her life. He noted that being mature and attempting to have personal freedom can create self-doubt, it can create anxiety, it can create uh, insulation, it can create insecurity, uh, it can create a sense of lo aloneness. Since he believed that <clears throat> when you grapple to develop meaning in your life, in many ways, you do it alone. It is your life. You are trying to find meaning for your life, which is different than the meaning of all other people's lives. And so he felt this was risky business. He felt you had to be pretty mature to, to really be looking for, for a meaning in your life, to be examining yourself and asking yourself, amongst all these people, uh, in which I live, how do I make a difference? Why am I important? Why is my life meaningful? And if you were willing to ask those questions and to grapple with them, uh, life could get scary at times. Oh, just a second here. I've not brought up our... Uh, Sorry about that. Now, Fromm uh, developed a theory, uh, and, and, and in order to break it down, I'm going to be somewhat simplistic, but you can reduce his position on human needs and how these are expressed by looking at six character types. And we'll discuss these, these human needs first because they lead into other parts of his theory. One of the profound life experiences upon which Fromm focused was the need for relatedness. 
And again, you know, focusing on, on the existential condition, Fromm believed that people really wished to seek mature love. And he defined mature love as a union under the condition of preserving one's integrity or preserving one's individuality. So mature love is a union in which you are involved with someone else, but you are able to preserve your own integrity while being involved with this other person. <coughs> and such mature love involves a concern for the welfare of others, but it truly focuses on attempting to make another person happy. Now you notice how much of our early psychoanalytic thinking the focus was on how the individual tries to make himself or herself happy. Fromm is saying that there really is a, a need in people to make other people happy, certainly if you're going to be mature. Uh, so here we have a very major step away from Freud. And Fromm had the healthy notion that you could truly desire to care for and love another person because you really wished to see them happy, excited, self-fulfilled, that, uh, that these kinds of feelings were quite possible, they were quite mature, they were the way life should be. And his focus on social needs allowed him to move away from Freud's theories that anything you did uh, was really driven by some sense of trying to do something for yourself. Now, strangely enough, having emphasized that, Fromm was criticized at times for abandoning the biological theory of Freud. And some gave the explanation that this only occurred because Fromm studied sociology. And had Fromm been wise enough to study medicine, he would really have found the truth, which was in Freud's theory. So here, you get a real split between the people who are focused on kind of the biological determinism of Freud and by this much more socially and existentially driven theory of Fromm. And this, simplif this simplification, you know, that you really have to choose between one or the other, uh, was really overdetermined by people who, who really resented that when Fromm began to become popular, uh, he took a lot of attention away from a traditional psychoanalytic theory. That is, when, when thinkers began to read Fromm, people got very excited about his ideas because, of course, they were liberating. Uh, they made people feel good about themselves. Uh, they took in, you know, concepts like, like really loving another person. And so uh, this caught on, and, and he was very popular. And also, Fromm deviated from psychoanalytic, uh, psychoanalytic theory in another way, and, and that is, uh, he didn't put much emphasis on, on what they called romantic love. And instead, he, d he posited there's really a deeper uh, experience in mankind where mature love was the goal in expressing one's need for relatedness. Romantic love, you know, simply meant kind of like being sexually involved with someone because they attract you. Uh, and Fromm went past that, didn't pay a lot of attention to that, and said, no, what the focus should be for an adult is, is on mature love, which is much more complicated than just being attracted to someone. Fromm also allowed for the achievement or satisfaction of a need by destructive tendencies. After all, he's going to see patients, he is going to see people being destructive. And, and in the need for relatedness, he noted that, that people can be submissive, uh, or they, they even can permit other people to simply dominate them. Thus, an individual might develop what we would call masochistic tendencies by making the other person all important and making oneself and one's own needs unimportant. <coughs> one also can pathologically seek, according to Fromm, to gratify you know, these kinds of destructive needs through sadism. That is true, that is the way in which you try to overcome your aloneness is by trying to dominate uh, in the extreme, even humiliate another person so that the other person will not leave uh, and they will remain with you. Now again, when you think back to our character types we've talked about before, the only person who's gonna remain in such a relationship 
is someone who is incredibly dependent and who thinks nothing of himself or herself and so they allow somebody else to, to truly dominate them. And Fromm even indicated that if, if you have pathological relationships, like I've just described, it is possible to achieve what, what might be a, a fictional union, but it certainly will be a union without love. It will serve uh, a purpose or an end, but he felt this is not at all what he wanted to talk about or what he was interested in. Instead, Fromm posited that being human actually causes us to need to transcend the human condition. And because we have both reason and imagination, we can attempt to be creative and go beyond whatever limits uh, we feel we have. That is the limits of who we are at this point. And he saw this as a healthy experience and in which we invest in new life and ideas by loving other people. So he wanted people to think about the fact that you can be more than you are. And if by extension, therefore, you can make the world a better place than you see it now. Again, because he saw a lot of troubled people, he also allowed for the negative side of transcendence. And the negative side of transcendence, of course, led to destruction. For example, he felt that people who were incapable of love and of earning love might actually try, try to destroy a loved object. A very crazy way to go about getting control, but certainly one he observed. An example uh, that he used was if you, you, you take a male lover who kidnaps a woman because he desires to, to, to have this woman and she has no interest. And then in the extreme, he ends up killing her because he cannot cope with not having her. So it turns out in this very psychotic kind of thinking, by destroying this woman, he finally gets control over her. So Fromm was pointing out that, you know, you have these wonderful urges if you're mature and you really can change life and you can transcend who you are now. But if you don't go in a positive direction, these very powerful urges can take you into a very pathological lifestyle and one in which terrible things can occur. Now then he talked about the need for rootedness. And this need has closely developed the long lines that Freud used actually to explain the Oedipus complex. Essentially, Fromm felt that mothers are extremely desirable to most children and that there is an interaction between mother and child that creates a great deal of specialness. And this specialness allows the child to feel rooted in his or her environment. And Fromm believed that Freud actually recognized this sense of rootedness in the way he described the intensity uh, that takes place in the Oedipus complex. But Fromm felt that Freud put too much emphasis on sexual characteristics uh, during this experience and not enough focus on the irrational affective origins of this attachment. That is, what Fromm was focusing on is not the stimulation in the body, and especially in the penis or the clitoris that goes on during this phase, but rather he was focusing on the, the more powerful psychological feelings one has of greatly desiring mom and of wanting to be close to mom. Essentially, Freud indicated, or excuse me, Fromm indicated, that it is extremely important for us to have roots so that we have a sense of security that will enable us to move towards this experience of being transcendent. Without these roots, his feeling is we become too frightened to seek gratification and we become too frightened to take the risks that are necessary in order to enter into a, a transcendent uh, sense. Now then, Fromm said, people have a need 
for identity. And this again is a healthy concept in which Fromm posits we have a need to express and to be our own unique selves. He emphasized that we need to discover ourselves and to be the kind of unique or special individual we desire rather than to become someone that others wished us to be. And that certainly was the, what he saw as the, the conflict for people. Either you become that unique person you can be, or if you don't have the ego to do that, then perhaps you will become the person that others want you to be. And others can be mom or dad, others can be some important person in your life, can be your spouse, uh, others can be what you think society in general wants of you. Now, obviously, if you really give in to letting others determine your life, it's a pathological condition. And whereas if you give in and focus on this deep desire within yourself to be a special person, to be a unique person, to kind of discover uh, what is uh, very particular about you, uh, you become healthy. And again, when he talked about this concept, he also said, there's a lot of personal risk if you decide to do this. Uh, the more you decide to be yourself, the more you're probably taking risks, and the more anxiety there may be. Now next, he talked about the need for a frame of orientation and devotion. Now, Fromm used this term to describe the perspective we need on reality as a means to, to make sense of our multiple experiences. And, and the concept here, by the way, really is quite complex. On the one hand, Fromm believed we need an orientation that allows us to account for how we behave in life. At the same time, he posited we also need and what he called an object of devotion. He sensed that most people worked this out in terms of having a God, but he allowed for a similar working out for individuals who had ideals that they might pursue. So that if, if God was not this kind of transcendent uh, person or transcendent belief that you move towards, you might substitute something like justice where your life is dedicated to trying to make the world a just place, or it, it might even be mature love, where your life is very dedicated to trying to do something for another person or other people. Uh, actually, you know, Fromm more identified with this latter, that is with people seeking uh, a sense of justice or a sense of love, and he did not, uh, he was not, uh, focused on religion later in his writings, although as a young man, he, he was a very religious man. Now then he talked about the need for excitement and stimulation. And he speculated that we all have this need. And he based some of this research, or he based some of this really on research, that indicated that without stimulation, we're unable to, to socially function. And for example, if you observe what happens to people who are in stimulus-free environments, you find that people become disoriented. You put people in a room that's all white, uh, there, there's no stimulation, there's no sound, uh, no music, they're just there by themselves. Actually, this can become quite disorienting after a, a time. Uh, for some people, they even become psychotic, that is, given that there is no stimulation around them, they manufacture a world in their mind, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to substitute for uh, the fact that there's no stimulation. And <coughs> this, this observation, by the way, uh, caused some psychologists <coughs> to do research on observations people were making about patients who undergo bypass surgery. And, excuse me. What actually happens, or what did happen at one time, was there was a belief that when people come 
from some very traumatic experience. And of course, in the early stages when bypass surgery was being done, this was traumatic. It's traumatic today, but it was even more traumatic then. And so what people wanted to happen is they wanted people who woke up from surgery to feel calm. So they actually put them in rooms in which there were no pictures, uh, there, was, there was no clock, uh, there was no stimulation at all <clears throat> when you woke up. And the idea being that people would then feel uh, very calm. Well, that's not at all what happened. You, when you think about it, in, uh, when people were undergoing bypass surgery, their biggest worry was, will I live? So when people were waking up, some of you have an active fantasy about this, when people were waking up and there was just white walls and there was no stimulation around, there was no clock, there was no windows, uh, people began to have fears that perhaps they did not survive the surgery. And, and we found that with some people, actually they started to get very anxious, even though they may have known that they had survived the surgery. But the lack of anything familiar uh, really made them very anxious. We found in, in actually a, a striking number of cases, people actually became psychotic for a brief period of time after bypass surgery when they woke up because they were so frightened. So what happened was they went to actually creating stimulation for people so that they now put people in rooms where there's a clock, where uh, there are pictures, where there are things that will be familiar to the person and often you know, have a loved one there uh, so when the person wakes up uh, right away, you're in an environment uh, that you're familiar with. And th this was, is very important to people. And we have found that, uh, that, that having stimulation seems to be absolutely necessary for people. And it is most necessary when very important events are occurring. So what happened with Fromm's theory that it allowed us to posit that stimulation is actually necessary, that it's helpful, and that it overcomes threats that occur in many circumstances. And, 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 and the ultimate way, I mean, what uh, the insight that Fromm had was that that stimulation actually can serve as an integrating force so that when the person, say, awakes from a traumatic experience like having undergone uh, serious surgery, the very fact that there's stimulation begins to integrate the whole trauma with the fact that I have survived and that my life is whole and that good things can happen. Now from then also developed character types. And he did not accept, as I've said several times, libido theory. Instead, he replaced it with two observations of his own. First, he observed that individual differences in temperament generally existed in people. And from this he argued that character, which is what he thought was the part of your personality built on experience, and temperament, which is what he thought was constitutional in your personality, combined to influence behavior. Then secondly, and this is actually more important, Fromm believed that people had innate needs and potentialities that unfold in the course of development, providing the social conditions are good. So he focused, you know, he allowed for, for temperament. He allowed for some biological uh, part of you that does have a, play a role in, in shaping your personality but he really thought uh, that personality development is much more social, but it, it really blossoms if, if the conditions are right. And so, having observed that, he then looked at, well, what could go wrong? And so, he believed that early life led to the formation of five, basically, neurotic character types. And he allowed uh, and, and talked about one healthy character type. Now the, the five neurotic character types start with the receptive character. And as we go through this, and I'll, I'll point this out to you, but you'll see 
Many of these character types, of course, you will recognize from some of our early theorists. Receptive types are people who believe that the source of all good lies outside themselves. Uh, these individuals, in many ways, then, are, are much like Freud's oral types, in that they're highly dependent, and they see the resolution of life as being contained in what can other people do for me. And like Freud, he described receptive characters as being cheerful, friendly, optimistic. In other words, they have learned how to appear to society so that society will do things for them. And the important issue here is that individuals take on this style of relating to others, not out of any concern for other people, but because the person feels that he or she can be cared for through contact with someone else. And it is only through that kind of contact with someone else that one has one's needs fulfilled. Uh, if you think back, even Horney's compliant type would also be very similar uh, to Fromm's receptive type. Now then, he said, like the receptive type, uh, you can have an exploitive character who believes that the sources of gratification are again outside the person. However, rather than relating gently and passively and with good humor and being nice, this character type aggressively seeks to gain attention and, and to seek nurturance by using force or cunning uh, on other people. And this subgroup exploits other people for their own ends. You, you could describe them as being people who attempt to uh, seduce another person's spouse or as persons who might plagiarize the works of other people. Uh, what is important here is that aggression is used to, uh, to seek satisfaction, and it's solely for oneself. It is, it is motivated by a profound belief that no one would really respond to the person, so the person must aggressively go out and get people or get things for themselves. Uh, you might recall that th this is similar to Horney's aggressive type. And, and, and just if you just listen to how this person behaves, you realize this is a very desperate character. I mean, this, and as you can imagine, if you knew someone like this, you would quickly want to not know them. So this is not somebody who most of us would be attracted to. Now then, Fromm talked about the hoarding character. And the hoarding character has many characteristics similar to obsessive compulsive personalities. This person saves things, behaves in ritualistic ways, and frequently is obsessed with, with orderliness and cleanliness. Uh, if anyone tends to interfere in this world, the individual often strikes out uh, being protective, very self-protective, uh, wanting to be alone. And the hoarding type character, according to Fromm, rarely has interpersonal relationships, and certainly uh, no in-depth relationships or intimate relationships. Uh, this is somewhat like uh, Horney's detached type. And, and what happens is, I mean, this person really limits not only relationships they have, but they even limit within their own home, for example, or their own apartment, what could possibly happen because everything is so orderly. In other words, there are no surprises. I never have to wonder where something is. I know where everything is. And I make sure that, you know, I won't have any difficulties with this by uh, not letting anybody else in my apartment or in my home. So this is a very rigid, unhappy kind of life. Sure. Did I not? Let's see. Uh, well, let's go back here. Okay, what did I miss? I wasn't. Okay, we, we did exploitive.
Here it is, right here. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, can you put up? I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. I, I didn't realize you had never seen it. Okay. Here's the exploitive character. Okay. And then after the exploitive character, we have the hoarding character. And after, okay, the hoarding character, we're going to have, and you'll love this term, we're going to have the necrophilus character. Now, I'm sorry, can, can you leave these up for a moment? Okay, have you seen? We got that one, we have. You've got that one. But we need 40. Okay. It's, in, in the slides, of course, they're, they're going to be the same as I'm telling you. So if you've been taking notes, you're not going to have really missed anything. But uh, I do want you to see this. So has everybody had a chance now to? Okay. Sorry about that. Now, what is interesting about uh, you know, personality theorists, they often go along and they have these terms that most of us can identify with. I mean, most of us understand what hoarding is and most of us will understand uh, a lot of the, the words that are used. And then someone comes up with a term like this, like the necrophilus character, which one has to really pay attention to because this is not a, a term you tend to throw around in everyday language. Uh, it's not a term that, uh, in fact, most of you will ever have used. This character type, by the way, is actually quite disturbed and is similar to the kind of early anal age fixated people. The individual tends to be destructive through actively exploiting and destroying other people and things. Essentially, all meaning in life comes from being hostile towards others. This is a person who has absolutely given up on intimacy. And Fromm noted was that people who developed this type of personality were, were frequently racial bigots. Uh, these people might be terrorists. Uh, they might even engage in enjoying torturing other people. And this latter idea, actually, that, that Fromm developed came from his observations during the Second World War, or at least that's what people speculate. And it, it's interesting, uh, anyone who lived during the Second World War, obviously, uh, in Europe, and he left Europe, uh, but the war had already started. And he would have been a young man in his early 20s, and he was Jewish. And by then, the anti-Semitism, of course, was terrible. And there was all kinds of pain. And one of the, the fascinating things is that, you know, people who saw that were so stunned by the, the terror that occurred during the war that they, they needed to come up with, with some way of explaining this. Fromm's way of explaining this was with the necrophilus character. That is a, a person who actually could enjoy doing great harm uh, to other people. And, and also, you know, in, in terms of Fromm himself, it took him a long time to come to grips with this. He did not write about this till more than 20 years after he came to the United States. And, and one of the things that we observed, by the way, amongst other people who saw atrocities during the Second World War, we often found in VA hospitals on psychiatric units uh, into the 60s and 70s, uh, especially in the 60s, often we had patients who had, uh, were, had had some kind of psychiatric problem during the Second World War, so they were still getting treated many years later. But uh, most often, these people could not talk about what went on in the war. I mean, it, it was fascinating. We had a whole generation of people who went to war, they came back from war, they could not talk about it. They could not talk about it because they had never been prepared for such atrocities, some of which they had to engage in, in the sense that, that obviously if you are in the military, you may have killed other people. Uh, with Fromm here, what happened is it wasn't that he engaged in any atrocities, but he felt absolutely helpless, as so many did, in observing atrocities or knowing that atrocities were going on. 
Now, the next uh, character, character type he talks about is the marketing character. And here, Fromm developed his own unique approach to a type of personality that, that he presents here. That is, this is not like any of the other types that you have heard about. Uh, we don't find a comparable description in, in Freud or Horney in this. What Fromm said is that in industrialized societies, people learn to treat themselves and others as if they're commodities. And thus, they bargain themselves for other things. And he would say that marketing types simply love another person for the value that that person brings to the relationship. And so when there is no more value for the relationship, then the person abandons this individual <coughs> to seek another loved object which might have a greater value. So in, in this character type, all relationships are seen in, in terms of barter. And there is no altruistic or genuine feeling that's existing between the marketing character and any other person. By the way, you know, this is certainly if you, any of you who watch soap operas, I mean, soap operas often are built on these themes that uh, somebody is valuable until somebody else comes along. And people are always breaking up because there is something, there is someone else who has so-called more to offer. Now, as I mentioned, Fromm had these character types, and he, so he had a number of pathological character types. He had only one healthy character type. And he comes up with this wonderful term, the biophilus character. Another word that you use every day, uh, common parlance. Uh, but personality theorists, when they wanted to say something important, often came up with a word like this that we would pay attention to because it's certainly not a term that gets used a lot. The truly healthy person was called the biophilus character. This is a person who loves life and seeks to be involved with others in a caring, thoughtful, and exemplary way, uh, never utilizing force or manipulation to draw attention uh, to themselves, uh, but trying to, to make themselves important by being so caring. In this character type, uh, people are free to be reflective and imaginative and to discover their own unique capacities and capabilities. And they also have the capacity to understand the uniqueness of other people and to become emotionally involved with unique other people. And Fromm noted that people who represented this character type had to work very hard at being loved, since this entailed a great deal of self-reflection to understand themselves and a great deal of reflection to understand the other person and to invest significantly in them. Uh, from these character types then, uh, we find that Fromm was much more social than other theorists. And he brought in not only social but economic forces as being determinants in personality development. And what's important uh, for you to remember about him is he did place much more emphasis on appreciating the culture, appreciating the rewards in culture, and appreciating the scariness that can take place if the culture is not helpful to you. Now that will conclude our discussion of Fromm, and we'll move on to Eric Erickson in our next uh, class. Thank you.